welcome to the Mind Money Spectrum podcast, where your hosts, Aaron Ogti and Trisha Patel, go beyond traditional finance questions to help you explore how to use your money to achieve the freedom you want in life. In this episode, Trishel and Aaron start by comparing value versus momentum investing. They then go down the rabbit hole of why momentum strategies work, in theory. The behavior of humans wanting more and more has been around longer than the stock market. The fear of missing out and keeping up with the Joneses come from how we feel when making emotion-driven comparisons. And so, if you acknowledge these feelings but then focus on the decision-making process, you may find that you are happier in the end, regardless of the result. And now, on to our conversation. Hi, my name is Aaron Ogti. I'm a financial advisor in the Bay Area, and I'm here with Trisha Patel, a wealth manager on the East Coast. Hey, Aaron. Great to be here today, and thanks, everybody, for listening. Great to be here as well. So last week, we talked about GameStop and uh, Reddit, Wall Street bets, and Robinhood, and hedge funds shorting extra stock. And, and as a kind of precursor to that conversation, I can't even brought it up, but what was going on, there was kind of... Trisha and I were almost laughing about it because you couldn't apply any kind of fundamental analysis to the behavior of that stock. There was nothing about GameStop's profitability, profitability or revenues or company outlook. There was nothing about that that was impacting the stock price of GameStop. And so as we kind of we had our conversation kind of trying to figure out, but like, we sort of think like, if you can't apply any kind of fundamental analysis, what other types of analysis could you apply? And so today, I think, I think we're going to try and talk about this, this idea of like just other ways of thinking about kind of markets and trading, uh, maybe a little bit of momentum, a little bit of trend following, but I think it really comes down to the human behavior side and just just the way people act either in response to kind of headline news or uh, the way that that people behave, I don't want to say irrationally because I think there's some reason for it, but counter to what any kind of again, logical fundamental, fundamental analysis would imply. So Trisha, kind of, after our conversation last week, we we're trying to think of if we can't apply fundamental analysis, how do we think about this? And like, I guess my, my, my hope is if we think about this and understand it, we might be able to see see it in real time next time maybe. I don't know what it's going to apply to, but, but maybe if we can think about that idea of just of how humans behave and the, the impact of that. When you think of like trying to apply another type of analysis and how markets reflect human behavior just as much as company profitability, what are other types of analysis that you think of? Well, the big distinction is there are two high level themes of understanding, you know, what to invest in. One is you want to take a passive stance and that means, you know, try not to actually predict what's going to happen and just, go with a passive index approach. But if you're trying to go with the alternative, the actively managed approach, then you're trying to answer two fundamental questions. And that is what to invest in and when do I invest in said thing in terms of you know timing. And then from that perspective, there are two high level ways of, of approaching active investing. One is this notion of fundamental analysis. It's also tied to this approach of value investing where you try to determine the intrinsic value of something like IBM. We love IBM, I guess. <laughs> it's always $100. And right, it's trading at 100 in some theoretical world, but um, maybe even ours. So you might say, I've looked into IBM, I've checked out the financials, I've run my models and it's actually worth $120 per share and therefore there's value in buying it. It's undervalued, so I'll buy it. So that, that's 
a common theme of fundamental analysis. But the, the flip side to that coin is something known as trend following or momentum. And there's nuances to the exact technical definition or distinction between momentum and trend following, but the high level theme of this type of approach is just looking for trends in the movement of securities and then using that information to make a play. For example, a positive trend following strategy or a positive momentum strategy notices that a stock has seen strong, for example, upward momentum, and therefore it may likely to, that momentum may be likely to continue. So th this effect has actually been studied statistically from many different perspectives. A AQR ran a strategy that was part of um, the founder Cliff Asnes thesis. So AQR is a large hedge fund with many billions of dollars, tens of billions. And part of their strategy is understanding whether a play should or an investment in a basket of stocks should be either momentum based or, or value based. But when they look for momentum, they look for things that are going up from a statistical perspective. And if they can analyze, you know, a basket of 500 stocks and say, these are the 10 most that are likely to exhibit momentum, then they'll go ahead and buy those and they'll sell or short taking, you know, the knowledge we learned on the GameStop uh, episode last week, the 10 stocks that are showing the 10 worst momentum, you know, are going down the most. And from that perspective, they may eke out a nice sensible return. So momentum is frankly, you know, just looking for these types of trends and trying to capitalize on them. And that's something one might do if they want to follow this path of analysis. So do you know anything about either that, that thesis or, because again, I, I have, I'm aware of the trend following strategy. I've, actually kind of been impressed by it sometimes uh, that there have been times where I've seen the strategy to have shown to be able to avoid downturns. So uh, th there have been a few hedge fund strategies that have applied a, a trend following strategy and avoided downturns both in kind of 2000, 2001, 2002, and in 2008, 2009. So I, I think there's some merit to this and my understanding is it's applying the idea that the stock price while it over the long run may reflect uh kind of the fundamentals the, the profitability the, the that cash flow analysis and discounting it based on interest rates in the shorter term by shorter term it could be like a few years, but definitely on the scale of days, weeks, months, even one to two years, more of the change in stock price is due to the fact that humans are trading these stocks, that they're kind of making bets. They're sometimes going with gut feelings, sometimes going with headline news, but, but there's enough kind of human behavior that goes into these. And so kind of if enough people start buying a stock that implies that and the stock price starts going up that more people kind of as we get more headline news will see the stock continue to go up because people are buying not because anything necessarily change about the company but the stock price is going up because people are optimistic about the stock and that if you can identify that early enough you might be able to kind of ride that trend up and so like i'm curious what what you understand about this idea of the stock price is going up because enough people think the stock price will go up and i know there's a little bit of tautology there but it's not quite it's it's, it's the uh, it's not they think the company do well but but they think the stock price. i, I think there's something there that People think the stock price is going up and therefore the stock price does go up because they are more people are buying into it. Yeah, th this ties into the branch of research known as behavior finance, where what behavior finance tries to do is it makes a distinction that 
yes, human beings like to be rea- rational and they understand how rational logic feeds into situations, but there's certain times where people behave irrationally at an individual level and at a population level. And this has been studied. We've, we've talked about this in, in a handful of occasions. We will include those episodes in the show notes. But the, the high level notion is there are definite periods where people will either be overconfident or they'll make decisions based upon imperfect information or they'll have this level of optimism that isn't warranted by the data. And th- on the flip side or on the next step forward of that, there's other people who realize these irrationalities and try to capitalize on it. So that there's two groups of individuals working uh, to pull the rope of the stock price on the upside, for example, with GameStop with this in mind. So there's one group that's saying, wow, it's going up. I better jump in on it. You know, this is the FOMO group, the people that don't want to miss out on something pretty incredible. And then there's the maybe slightly more rational group realizing that a FOMO group does exist and they want to capitalize on the fact that they know that a FOMO group will exist. So they want to also jump in on GameStop, for example, which would push the stock price up even more. And everybody, of course, is hoping that they'll get out before everybody realizes that GameStop is way too overpriced. They, they want to be the lesser fool in this greater fool theory. So th- th- that's how it might work, meaning it's not necessarily that you're irrational or you're not uh, or you're following an irrational instinct to buy GameStop. You might be doing it for rational reasons. But um, I I think it also relates to the notion that you are trying to actively manage a decision and you're trying to do better than you would from a passive standpoint. And at the end of the day, you know, the question is, will this lead to sensible and favorable and superlative returns for even the the rational investors who are trying to capitalize on the FOMO investors. So one, I need to like admit I'm not as young as I used to be and kind of just double checking. Uh, I remember reading some sort of like the, the Reddit Wall Street Bets was YOLO, you only live once, uh, which is a <laughs> newer carpe diem kind of thing. Uh, but FOMO is fear of missing out. And so I, I think I want, want to kind of explore that a little bit, like just just if, so kind of, kind of like what leads to that idea that like the, 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 the people who are buying in, I don't think they're necessarily applying the, idea, the, the, the greater fool theory or, or trying to be a lesser fool, but they are, I, 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 intelligent, rational people are making these purchases because it, like this, this trend idea has existed for a long time and it's played out enough that some hedge funds can benefit from this. But I'm kind of thinking like, why, explore that, like, why does that exist? And it's like, why do people buy... And, uh, why, it might become like just the classic emotional cycle related to investments. Like, why do people buy things that are going up and feel the most greedy at the peak? And then when it says it kind of comes down, they feel the despair on the way down. They keep selling on the way down, and they feel worse at the bottom. Like, like why do people feel? the opposite of what an investing strategy should be. So kind of what le- I'm trying to think like what leads to those, those idea of trends and why do people keep buying things on the way up? It's actually, it's actually very similar to, to Bitcoin and buying Bitcoin at 30,000. It's like, uh, you've seen it go up. And I guess theoretically with Bitcoin, because it 
I guess it's by almost any stock, like there's a finite number of shares, finite number of Bitcoin. If the demand goes up, there's more people want to buy. So I mean, like, so is there a demand component? Like, like why does demand go up because the stock price or the Bitcoin price has gone up? A good part of what uh, Cliff Asnes was trying to say in his paper, Value and Momentum Everywhere, is that it's it's human nature to have this um, this desire to jump on the bandwagon and not miss out on things. So the notion is that these types of trend ideas have existed, you know, long before our financial markets in the U.S. He in his paper he cited evidence that this notion of trend has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's basically ingrained into how humans behave. And I, I think that is sensible. I'm not sure if it's sensible to the point where one can capitalize on it and make money to kind of outperform a, a passive strategy. I did study these specific notions of trend in, in detail when I was working at the, the when I was a portfolio manager for a hedge fund and part of what we would do is we would replicate studies and we actually replicated the study for, for that paper value and momentum everywhere. And what we kind of noticed is it did actually look good for a good amount of the period, but then we ran it forward another five to 10 years beyond, you know, the graph in the paper and the graph in the paper, it looked like the stock, you know, the strategy was going up and up and making money but then we ran it forward another five or six years after that, and it kind of flatlined. And what we notice is kind of in line with what you might expect. You can't necessarily scale these ideas indefinitely. For example, if everybody knows about this momentum effect, you know, it's been published, it's out there. Plenty of hedge funds can take that formula and take make their own versions of it and put money behind it. Well, then that effect should slowly be diminished or people will try to kind of front run that effect, right? If they're going to look 360 days, I'm going to look 359 days and, you know, jump ahead of that trade and then 358 and 357, Mm. you you get the point. And over time, you know, more and more money gets piled into these notions. So it gets harder and harder to eke out an edge. And it kind of explains why you, it's very hard to have tens of billions of dollars like AQR does and still provide these uh, crazy returns that were highly attractive when they were much smaller. So uh, I think from the standpoint of it existing, I, I think it does exist be, and it's tied to human nature. And I'll talk a little bit about that in um, just a bit. But I, I think you know, even though it exists, it may have been possible to capitalize on it But I think we're at the point now where there's just so much competition understanding this notion of of FOMO that it might have already been, you know, as we would say, arbitraged away. It might have already been able, it might have been lost in the the randomness that gets created after something is already discovered and priced into the market. So what, what I like to say is, you know, the markets gravitate towards efficiency they may not be efficient at any given time, but they generally move in that direction. But just because, you know, admitting admitting that the markets are not efficient, that there is large irrationality, that doesn't mean that we can understand when that irrationality exists to the point that we can make a trade and we can actually exit that trade such that we can profit off that trade And when I mean profit, I mean do better than we would just investing passively. So we have to include that opportunity cost of what we would have earned if we had just taken a more simpler approach that's passive in nature. And I I believe doing that is a lot harder, even though in theory, I I am admitting that yes, FOMO exists and it does impact market movements. And we have seen it, you know, play out, for example, with GameStop. So I'm not sure what I would say we could do, even with hindsight, to make money off of these type of situations, even though I believe they'll continue to exist. Uh, that reminds me, I don't know where the quote comes from, but uh, uh, markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. 
Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, we, we saw that play out in like the matter of days with, with some of the the hedge funds, but um, all right, that, that's kind of a, a similar idea to kind of what you're talking about. A- and when you, th- I, I I do like the idea of kind of exploring that that FOMO feeling and trying to, it's almost kind of guessing the evolutionary psychology aspect, kind of like why do our brains work this way? Um, two of the, the classic examples where humans find behavior, or sorry, humans find patterns in randomness. Uh, and because they're kind of always looking out for something, it kind of comes back to the idea like that from an evolutionary perspective, if I see the grass moving and I assume it's a tiger, then I run away and I live. If I assume it's the wind, and it probably is the wind, but the few times that it's not the wind and it is the tiger, I die and my genes don't get passed on. So if like a long enough evolution perspective, that's a, a story of trying to understand how humans find, a kind of like a wired to look for patterns and explanation in in randomness uh kind of another ex- explanation like kind of why humans are tribal is uh kind of literally survival depended on it that if you didn't get along with the group that you were in and you were kicked out of the group you probably died out in the wilderness and so that's another area where humans are hardwired to get along with the people that because it, at one point in our history it was necessary for our survival and those those social aspects are still very important that's kind of why we like getting together and like where all those positive feelings come from um so when i think of like the fomo and like it's almost like a a keeping up with the joneses feeling that we have and it's not saying that it's a good thing or bad thing but if we try to understand why it's there and this is more me guessing i haven't kind of I haven't read any research or, or other conjectures on this but like if I was a prehistoric human and I'm trying to save food for the winter and I, I think I've saved up enough so that I will survive through the winter, but I see my neighbor in his cave has saved up more food for the winter. Now I'm actually worried, did I save enough to survive? Maybe I should save more so that I have as much as my neighbor. And again, this is a guess kind of like, I can th- think about, or again, really guessing here, but like trying to find some explanation for why human beings are hardwired for that, that feeling of keeping up with the Joneses, that feeling of comparing to our peers and neighbors and in this case, because of the internet and social media, now our peers and neighbors are pretty much everyone in the world. So if I see other people making money on GameStop, I want I have this innate feeling, I also want to make money on GameStop. Do, and it's like, that's my innate feeling. It's like, oh no, I want to have more. It takes my my rational side, like, under, trying to think about why I want more and where those feelings are coming from and can I resist some of those urges, but that that feeling is still there, and and I I, I do wonder, like how often that that keeping up with the Joneses, that that comparison feeling drives some of these behaviors, and I'm I'm curious what does does that guess sound okay or like do, do you need do, do you have any corrections or suggestions on that guess i don't have any corrections because i i'm uh <laughs> i'm gonna you know just hypothesize as well with with no evidence to oh to man that's a much better word than guessing <laughs> <laughs> well uh, you know I'm, I'm out of my element here so i what what i would say is it's something I mentioned in the past in a handful of episodes, but it seems like with humans in general, the underlying emotion 
you know, kind of underneath anything we're feeling at any given time is, is this feeling of angst and uncomfortableness. Of course, you know, when we're sa sad, we feel uncomfortable and not happy. We want to change our situation. But I feel like that also happens when we're happy as well. We have this sort of unsettling feeling like the happiness may go away or something may interrupt it or we could be happier if we did something else. So it's like the if onlys or the shoulds are still mm -hmm. pervasive in our mind because we know that there's always something that can happen tomorrow. And it, it leads to this feeling of you know, this slight agitation, or, or as I called it, angst. And frankly, if I push that uh, logic a little bit harder into the next level, it seems like it's, I don't want to say always, but vastly tied to this feeling of FOMO in, in all situations. And th the reason I say that is because Again, you know, if you're you're sad, you of course you feel like, well, it, it, I should be happier because you know Joe, John, and Jim are happier. Why why aren't I? You know, it's it's the FOMO gene. But also, you know, if I'm happy, it seems like it crops up there as well because you know what can jump in and take over my happiness? Well, I I could get sick, or I, I could get into an accident, or I could get sued, or I could miss out on that GME, the GameStop, or what if I didn't buy Bitcoin? All of these could still prop up, even if you're happy, or even if you bought Bitcoin. Well, now what? <laughs> <laughs> what if it goes down? What if I lose it all? What if I don't time it right? What if it goes to, you know, from forty-five thousand to four hundred and fifty thousand, but I sell it at fifty thousand? So that I, I think the FOMO gene is quite pervasive in, in all of our actions. If I, if I had to re reduce all, what kind of drives a strong part of our behavior. And I, I think you're right. There's probably evolutionary pinpoints on what, why something like that would be sensible. And, you know, the, the examples you laid out make sense to me. The, the notion that as creatures, we're, we're, we're animals were designed to kind of seek out more than what we're at right now to make things better, hopefully in the future. And, and that's probably driven by this uncomfortable angst driven by the, this fear of missing out. And from that perspective, you know, I've, I've noticed it all over the place. If you kind of try to view it from this particular lens, you can see it as we've seen in the markets, with Bitcoin and GameStop and the markets at all time high, or you know, interest rates are very low. So we got why not pay 20, 30 percent more on a house than <laughs> you might have otherwise if you can lock in a rate that's close to inflation. So that I, I think this props up all over the place as we we kind of look around this essentially certainly in the financial markets, but I think also as people are, you know, going through their lives, if they're young teenagers, as you mentioned with social media, or if they're adults, or even as they age, and they, they think about what they might have missed out on or what they can do in, in their final years of their life, I think it's quite pervasive, this feeling. Yeah, I, I was reminded of another kind of behavioral uh, or evolutionary psychology story, um, we kind of talked about that that idea of how do we know when we have enough, and like we're we're hardwired to want more. Uh, I remember kind of someone asking, "Why don't human beings, if fruits and vegetables are healthier for us, why aren't we kind of hardwired to enjoy the taste of fruits and vegetables?" And it actually goes back to, the, again, the idea that uh, resources were scar scarce and sometimes just staying alive was difficult. So we're actually hardwired to like the taste of fats and sugars because those are really high in calories. And so kind of we would get the food and eat the meal when we could because we didn't necessarily know when our next meal was coming. 
and so a little bit of a kind of the, like the storing aspect but that that's the i can see it's also related to the idea that no actually we're hardwired to want more because as humans evolved we we needed to get more now because we didn't know what we could get a month from now or even a season later and, and so kind of like i think we are hardwired to want more um that that your your bitcoin like do i buy it how would you feel about Bitcoin, buying Bitcoin at 45,000, selling at 50,000, if it goes to 450,000. And it reminds me of similar conversations I've had with clients who have employee stock or employer stock. So they have stock in their company that's been granted either via options or, or RSUs. And it comes to sell, it's like, okay, it's at a certain price, but it drops the week before. Do we hold it, wait to see if it goes back up to the price it was last week. And anytime we're, I kind of talk about this, anytime we're trying to pick the stock price we sell at, there, it's, I don't tell them because I try to be nicer, but it kind of, it's a fool's errand. That the idea is like, it's, it's just going to be too random in the short term to make any kind of justification. And so for clients who have sold stock in the past and the stock price goes up or they've held on to stock in the past and the stock price goes down the way i kind of help them feel better is by focusing on the decision making process over the result and they're na- they're able to look back and understand no i sold then for this reason. And so even though the stock price went up after they sold, they feel better about it because they don't they aren't thinking about lost gain. They're thinking about what the money was for. And I, I do wonder if that's again kind of try to apply the the rational brain side, but when people are trying to look at GameStop stock or bitcoin and there's no kind of rational reason to make an investment in this there's uh there's no kind of price target like like, to try to pick when you buy in and when you when you sell out that might be the hard part like do you sell bitcoin at fifty thousand or five hundred thousand and just i think i think that's the gain for the sake of gain it both feeds and depends on that FOMO feeling. If you kind of keep, if you can see my connection there, that just wanting more for the sake of wanting more tends to both depend on and create those feelings. Whereas buying something for a reason and selling it for a reason that's more related to your life isn't related to those th- that FOMO feeling. Yeah, I think a few things come to mind that, that I, I I definitely like that you said, and I'm always a big fan when you when you bring up process, especially in these situations because. As you said, for example, with you know owning stock in a company that you know maybe you've been granted them, so it wasn't really your choice to receive them. But now that you have them, you have an important decision to make, and that's when to sell. And then the question does inevitably come up: Should I try to figure out what's the perfect time to sell? And if you have that mindset, then it seems like you, you might be setting yourself up for disappointment because it, you can't figure out the perfect time. It's so hard to do. And even if you do, it might be more luck than actual skill. If you kind of think about this as something that you might be able to repeat on a go forward basis. And that's why it certainly makes sense to understand that, you know, if you, if you want to serve yourself the most, you might want to 
in certain situations, try to keep the, the FOMO gene in check. And this seems like a good one where, like you said, if, if you kind of shift the focus from, you know, let, let's, instead of trying to find the perfect exit point for this position, how about instead we have a process that says once a position reaches this side size, we pull back and we rebalance so that it doesn't end up commanding too large of a share of your total net worth, you know, something like that, that's more process based and more formulative and that way whether you missed out or you got lucky, well, it's not because you made a decision that led to that. No, you were just following your process and the chips landed where they landed. I, I, so I keep coming back like, does that, does that imply that everyone buying into GameStop, I guess there's at some point people buying into GameStop didn't have a process, but it's possible like those who early on did like that, this, like the wall street bets that noticed the short position. I feel like there is a process there. Um, there may be. But... Yeah. One thing, for example, that we really focused on when I was at the hedge fund is process investing process. And what we tried to do is, a good part of sensible investing is separating emotions from you know what you know. And the best way to do that is like we've said in this episode to put a process in place. So it's still possible to make this type of investment decision and figure out a time to invest in GameStop even, for example, in and out. But your chances of success are certainly heightened if you have a rigorous process that backs it. So, you know, what we did is we tried to follow a scientific method. We were a quantitative hedge fund. So we conducted research. We had a hypothesis. So it started with a rational or a, a reason that could be backed and tested, a testable reason. And we ran numbers and we did our hypothesis testing and we looked for a significance. And if it didn't, we didn't rerun the test a million times until we got the results that we liked with, with different data. We <laughs> said, no, the, the hypothesis is wrong, trying to move on. But if, it, if the hypothesis was correct, we did you know the next kind of what you would do with a pharmaceutical drug in the pipeline. You do your small size testing, your population testing, your phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And we did all of that. And finally, we had a set of rules or a process that we would follow that would guide our investment decisions. So I'd say it's certainly possible to apply that level of rigor to a situation like this with GameStop. You could look at past situations where this has come up and you could use your best analysis of the data at hand. But um, I'd say two things. One, it's hard to say that a, a large majority of the individuals who went into this trade had that level of rigor tied to their investment decisions. And, and two, I'd say even if you did have that level of rigor, it, it's very hard to be able to pull that off on a repeatable basis. You know, many hedge funds do try this and it's a very hard game to play that there's no single set of research that says that hedge funds actually frankly are able to do this on aggregate on a consistent basis there will be outliers but analysis deeper analysis says those could also be statistical aberrations or that they would be statistical likelihood outcomes rather than actual skill being added to the table so even the good hedge funds may be subject to the wider effect. That, that's quite true. So a, a large part of the FOMO is that everybody might be hearing of somebody who has done this you know, successfully, whether it's this hedge fund or that neighbor or that news article. And it, there's a huge amount of cognitive distortions get, that get tied into this game. And I think it kind of feeds into um, adding more adding a, a, a lot more fuel to the FOMO fire. And I think we, we've touched about this uh, early on this episode, but social media is like the, the amplifier to these effects. And it, it kind of 
turns up the the volume and the voltage of the, these types of effects. So we, we see the very large swings that we did as they manifest in society and in the financial markets in this case. So I, again, I don't want to kind of devolve back into the, the GameStop discussion, but I almost, in addition to social media, I do think about the uh, okay, Robin Hood decreasing transaction costs and, and it, it like, it decreases the friction to go down the slippery slope kind of thing. I, I'm trying to think like a good analogy, like or like mixing metaphors, something like that. But it's, I, I do, between social media and other technologies, we are probably in an era where a lot of these kind of FOMO results are accelerated, I guess I'd say. Like it's almost like it, it can it can happen so fast before caution can be applied. I, I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm probably not doing a great job. Like I'm trying to think out loud of of technology accelerating in the past, where something may have slowed it down from hitting such extremes. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I think it's a combination of, of many things. One is, I, I think, you know, marketing folk have discovered this human inclination towards FOMO, and they've capitalized it for, you know, decades at this point, if not far longer, but the, I think they found a precision to it where a lot of our actions can be controlled by understanding that this is a, a big driver of how we react to things and, you know, kind of by pulling the right strings, you can make people react in the way that you want. We, we all have seen, you know, the um, the beer commercials with people on the beach having a great time sipping beverages and playing volleyball. And we, we see the fast cars on the, on the, you know, for the car commercials and all of the other marketing hype, it's all driving this, this same type of belief and it's leading to increased sales. But, you know, now we have this hyper-connected world, of course, with social media. So it's, of course, been studied at this point, the notion that FOMO has these effects of reducing satisfaction. And it's also been studied that the more tuned in that individuals are to these various channels, either marketing channels or social media channels or you know, in this case, it was Reddit, Wall Street bets and whatnot, that it can greatly amplify the effects that these different viewpoints can have on individuals' behavior that would have been a lot harder, you know, 10, 20 years ago. You're talking about the, the market, I can't, you mentioned the car commercials and I, or cars, and I, I, I can't help, I can't help but think every sedan commercial is a professional driver on a closed course. As like, s no one's driving sedans and compact cars 80 miles an hour on a racetrack. Like 98% like of people are driving, they're just driving to work. But it's still showing the speed, acceleration, handling. But every minivan shows the van coming to a stop and the family safely getting out of the car. Like every minivan commercial is showing the family getting out of the car. And like, I'm, I'm sure they're like really home. Like you said, the marketing probably has this to a precision and that's probably been feeding the feelings in society probably for a few decades now, even be, definitely before the internet. And so I, I almost wonder if we could attribute those those impacts of like media and marketing almost setting societal expectations. Trying try to think like how to. I I hadn't thought about that from that perspective. I I, I see the keeping up with the Joneses, and I see the kind of desire for more just for the sake of having more and i see the speed of the internet accelerating things um 
even before Robin Hood came along, it, it, we still saw news travel faster and faster. But I hadn't thought about from the uh, marketing perspective, like people getting paid to influence incentives at a societal scale. Like, like it for them, like if they do a good job, they get paid more. And is this a just natural result of capitalism? Is this a is it something that could be fixed? Is that even possible? Because like, I think you're right. I think F- FOMO is driven almost by marketing as much as any other component. I hadn't thought about that. It seems like it's just so powerful and there's so many different channels to pull it off. It's something we, we mentioned in the last episode with, with GameStop and Robinhood where the Robinhood traders or, you know, people buying GameStop on Robinhood, they're not the clients of Robinhood. They're the product. Meaning what's being actually sold is the information about their trades to hedge funds. Well, with companies like Facebook and social media, you know, we're not the clients of Facebook, we're the products of Facebook. Our information and how we behave is being sold and used to sell us back things (laughs) for money. And, you know, this behavior can be distilled and understood and it can be channeled in a way so that the results are to drive our dollars to do things, including, you know, buying stock, for example, to Robin Hood and with low commissions or no commissions, or even with, we've seen the, the impact of influencers who are paid to market products. That's a common theme. And we've also seen the ability of different political ideas and social ideas to be disseminated through Facebook groups based upon algorithms that try to key into what are you most likely to react to. And these are all just different manifestations of jumping on the the FOMO gene. Like, what, what should I be thinking about? What should I be buying? What should I be spending? What should I be advocating for? (laughs) Yeah. (sighs) So the, the reason I'm kind of pausing and and sighing is when, when it came to think about the FOMO and buying Bitcoin, buy, buying GameStop, or even selling at a company stock, like uh, focusing on that decision-making process, kind of process over results, I felt comfortable with that. Like I, I, could, I could actually apply that to my life. I could use that to help clients. But like overcoming marketing at a societal scale, like I, I, I don't even know how to help myself from that perspective. Like, do, do you have any ideas that that come to mind of of being confident in the life that you have and not being influenced by? The, by by media and marketing? I think there's a handful of things that kind of go through my mind with this. I think one, it, it may be worthwhile to be less connected and less plugged into all of these different channels. Like I, I prefer to turn off all of my uh, tracking for, for Google and stuff like that. I use DuckDuckGo because I don't need to see ads about whatever I search on when I go to a news site, you know. And I, I try to limit my, my social media to once every, you know, few months or something like that. And there there has been research that says you know if if you do try to unplug from these things your satisfaction can be helped because of the impacts of fomo tend to lead to more anxiety more uncomfortableness more depression so there's things you can do to be proactive i'd say with that you can unplug and tune out a bit 
even give yourself, you know, a little bit of um, vacation away from the buzz, disconnect. But at, at the same time, it also helps to just recognize a bit that this is a strong driver of how we behave. Maybe just recognizing the notion that, hey, am I doing this because of something I really want and I care about, or am I doing it because of FOMO? You know, that, that might be a good question to ask ourselves every now and then. Uh, I mean, okay, so you got um, two big things. One, as soon as you mentioned like the idea of not using social media very often, like every few months, like, but I would feel like I'd miss out on so much of what's going on with my friends and family's lives. Like just you saying that invoked that FOMO feeling so strong. <laughs> <sighs> so it, it, here's, it's a tricky part because frankly, if you did it, you might actually be happier. So then the question you may need to ask yourself is, which do you want more? Do you want to you want to not miss out on things or do you want to be happier? <laughs> That's a good phrase. Um, the other the other component I was thinking like where you kind of like it's choosing what you would like to do that makes you happy. Like th this is one of the reasons why I go through Kinder's three questions and go through life planning conversations with clients. And when I think about it for myself, it's actually easier for me to remember that a big reason I started my business was to be able to coach my daughter's softball teams and go skiing. Like, like for those, like I, those are oversimplification, but it was that, that kind of time flexibility and agency and control of my schedule. And that, that kind of, rather than thinking about going away from social media, a lot of times it's because I, because I do think like when I do those things, I like go skiing with my kids, I take pictures and videos and put them on social media. Um, but that is like, instead of going away from social media, what am I going towards? And that does help me feel better about the days. Okay. No, no, I'm turning off my computer. I'm going outside in the backyard to play catch. Like the softball season's coming up, it's time to start practicing, and that 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 idea of what you're moving towards that might be the the kind of the 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 decision making process component um, that I've gone through my kind of my own life planning conversations, and I know kind of the life I'd like to have, and more social media was not in that that life plan and. Um, kind of, again, having that, that really good idea of what do I want to be moving towards? And so that way I, on a, just like a day-to-day -day basis, as I move towards that, uh, I, I do feel better. So if I, if I pick up my phone, I'm more likely to work on the crossword puzzle than go to Facebook. I have, I have kind of noticed that over the last few months, maybe year plus, um, but yeah, I, I, that maybe that like that just I, it's kind of, I forget what how you phrased it, but yeah, what, it's not giving up social media per se; it's choosing to do something else instead. And in the absence of that, social media and other screen things might just be the easier way to fill your time without thinking about it. And but if you are consciously choosing to do something else it might be easier to let that part go all right good stuff aaron now i'm actually kind of glad like netflix doesn't have commercials <laughs> <laughs> well uh, maybe that's there's something else there about like the maybe a, long, a future conversation about like advertising versus to get something for like accepting ads to watch something for free versus paying for the, the content itself. I don't know. I don't have to, I'll have to think about it. Like, but well, yeah, it's, I still can't believe you can avoid 
I, I feel how could you like check in with social media like every few months? I feel like it's just like an all or nothing. Like I know people who don't participate have Facebook at all and, and they do just fine. I know people who have it but check it not not obsessively, but regularly. And so like how you do it intermittently like almost baffles me. Like like what, what is what what is your process for like, oh, I think I'm gonna check on it today. <laughs> You know, it used to be before I had the business, I had an annual check in. <laughs> so <laughs> I'd log into Facebook because you'd get uh, more notifications around your birthday, I guess, because, oh. come up, you know, they see. <laughs> so I do my yearly check in saying, you know, thanks and, <laughs> you know, thumbs up and, and stuff like that. And it was once a year, but uh, I'm doing it more often because uh, I because of this business. <laughs> and okay. I have more people you know, interacting because of the podcast and stuff like that. And I, I, that's why it ends up being a couple of times a month. And I don't think I've looked at it this year, but I'm, I'm probably due. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. As long as we, I, I like that you have a good process around it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think it, it is, it, there's a lot of good things about it. So it, it's not like an evil to be stamped out, but it, it's something to be understood that might be having effects that may be unintended or undesirable from some perspective. And it's, it's just good to know as a first step or notice them. Okay. I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that and and kind of how my marketing and social media will drive uh, the same causes that result in trends in the stock market. <laughs> right. So I, I like your conclusion. Uh, this, this was a, this is a good one. I, I uh, like always, I, I, I feel, I feel genuinely feel better after a conversation. So, so thank you for that, Trishel. Good stuff. I, I feel better too. I was going to throw in a, a quote because it, it just came up as I was searching for, for this topic. And it said, this was a quote from, from Buddha. And he said, do not dwell in the past. Do not dream of the future. Concentrate on the mind of the present moment. I like that. It it's relates to uh, the best version that I've been able to apply actually came from the Netflix TV show, Luke Cage. Uh, one, one of the characters kind of said it was Is always a contemporary cool. Buddha, right? Yeah. No, no, not Luke Cage. It was actually uh, the barber. Okay. <laughs> it's protege. Sure. Um, it was always forward. And right. it is kind of, I like that idea of it. And it, I think it fits with that, that Buddha quote. So just the idea that, uh, you're, you're not thinking about the future per se, and you're definitely not dwelling on the past, but to kind of find that, that balance between ambition and contentment, it, kind of wanting to improve while still being happy with yourself in the moment is that always forward, always forward idea of if we are moving forward, but focused on just the next step forward, that does seem to be that that balance between stopping to smell the roses sometimes without being lazy. And it, it's okay to have some ambition, but you're not allowing it to be all encompassing. You're allowing it yourself to be happy in the moment. And so I, I kind of kind of like that that quote, but uh I've seen that a few other times, but yeah, that, that was a good one. Well, thanks, Aaron. I enjoyed the conversation and thanks everybody for listening. Thanks as if well. You're... Oh, yep. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I paused in my script. <laughs> it's okay. Keep this part in. Okay. <laughs> if you're enjoying these conversations, do spread the word. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of the Mind Money Spectrum podcast. Be sure to visit mindmoneyspectrum.com to access the entire library of episodes. Remember, 
it's not black and white, but the wide spectrum of gray area where you get to pursue the freedoms you want in life. Opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance referenced is historical as no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested directly. Have a nice day.